This is Tokens. I'm Lee C. Camp. Today, an episode on evolutionary psychology. What is evolutionary psychology, you ask? Well, if we define psychology as the scientific study of human thought and behavior... Evolutionary psychology then adds this perspective that we are evolved from past selective conditions, and that helps us understand better why it is we look like we do today. That's Dr. Justin Barrett, founder and president of Blueprint 1543, former professor at Fuller Theological Seminary and former senior researcher at Oxford University. Recently, he's the author of the book Thriving with Stone Age Minds, Evolutionary Psychology, Christian Faith, and the Quest for Human Flourishing. One way of capturing what makes humans really special from an evolutionary perspective is we're the animal that can love. Today, an array of helpful insights about the human condition, all from a field some people of faith tend to hold at arm's length. Is it possible that God used an evolutionary process to bring us about, to bring about other species? Is that outside of God's power? Surely not outside of God's power. Okay then, let me understand it the best I can and see if it gives me explanatory tools or fresh perspectives that are useful. All this coming right up. Justin Barrett did his PhD work at Cornell University and is currently the founder and president of Blueprint 1543 an adjunct professor of psychology at Fuller Theological Seminary, where he was formerly director of the Thrive Center and chief project developer for science, theology, and religion initiatives. Today we're discussing his most recent book, Thriving with Stone Age Minds, Evolutionary Psychology, Christian Faith, and the Quest for Human Flourishing, which he co-authored with Pamela King. Welcome, Justin. Thank you, Lee. It's good to be here. Good to have you with us. Been uh, looking forward to this conversation. We, you and I, have known each other for a number of years because of working on different projects in these this field, and it's uh, it's great to get to be with you. Yeah. So, evolutionary psychology. I doubt that there's a lot of people on the street that could give us a definition of evolutionary psychology, but uh, it seems to me that your discussion of donuts seems to be a great place to start in trying to make sense of what evolutionary psychology is. And, and even if it isn't donuts, right? Yeah, it's I a mean, great place to start on this morning. It's a great place to start anyway. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's one of these kind of textbook examples of how an evolutionary perspective can give us a new angle on how to think about our motivations, our psychology, how we behave. And donuts, right? Uh, why are we so drawn to these sugary, fatty things that they're just delicious? And if we eat too many of them, it'll kill us. And yet we're drawn to them. What's that about? Indeed, indeed. And, uh, you know, the sort of textbook story is that we have mechanisms, psychological sort of tendencies to be attracted to sweet and fatty things because in our past, our species past, those would have been hard to come by, but very important for our nutrition. Sweet things would indicate berries, fruits of that sort that are hard to come by. They're hard to keep. They go bad quickly. Lots of vitamins in that. And so you want to be attracted to those. And fats, well, that would have been animal fats for the most part, which took a lot of work to sort of kill and prepare the animal, cook it in a way that made it safe to eat and so forth. But we get a whole lot of nutrient, a lot of energy from from fats. So there's something good to be attracted to fats and sugars in those conditions where they're hard to come by. Well, now they're not hard to come by. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we can get <laughs> ourselves into trouble. That's right. So it's an illustration of this sort of mismatch between what you might call our nature and then our con- current environment or, you know, the survival demands on us now are very different. Our niche is very different than it was. So inse- instead of the instead of the devil made me do it, it's the uh, my ancestors evolutionary history made me do it. Those darn ancestors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can always blame our parents. Right. And when we blame yes, our parents, that's right. parents. That's right. <laughs> so so evolutionary psychology, then you're, you're presuming the basics of evolutionary theory with regard to modification and adaptation and propagation of the species and so forth, natural selection. And then you're asking, why do we do some of the things we do? How do we make sense of the way we are. Is that is that a fair enough way to summarize that? 
That's right. As psychology is the scientific study of human thought and behavior. Evolutionary psychology then adds this perspective that we uh, are evolved from, you know, under past selective uh, conditions. And that helps us understand better why it is we look like we do today. And sometimes yeah. why it, we seem like we're a mismatch for the world we live in. So you say there, and I guess it's midway through the book, that we're, we're in effect working with Stone Age minds in our given context. And you can make sense of why we do some of the things we do if you look back and say, well, this is the way our minds and our bodies evolved to deal with the circumstances in which we found ourselves as a species and then explain them from there. That's right. That's right. Uh, you can almost think of it as sort of residual kinds of features of us that are left over from a bygone era. But, you know, really that bygone era is only a couple of hundred years ago for most of the world. We sometimes forget that. Hmm. But up until, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, the majority of people in the world were still living in pretty close to Stone Age kinds of conditions. Hmm. And it's easy for us to forget in this sort of hyper-industrialized, urbanized West. Yeah. 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 So, you mentioned the word niche just a moment ago. And so the nature niche gap is a key construct throughout your book. So could you kind of explain to us what you mean by that? Sure. Yeah. By nature, I mean the set of traits, capacities, propensities, features, whatever you like, that we typically are going to have just by virtue of being human beings growing up in ordinary human environments. Don't need special tools or education or cultural conditions, just sort of what it means to sort of grow up to be a human. That's our nature. And then our, our niche is, it's a slightly sort of technical concept uh, that's related to our environment, but it's not quite identical to our environment. It's kind of the, I, I try to think of it as the functional environment. It's the environment, how the environment impinges upon what we need to do in order to make it to, uh, to survive, to reproduce, to whatever, you know, those fitness demands are. That's our niche. Sometimes ecologists compare this to your occupation. Uh, it's not your address, but your occupation. Hmm. But of course, where you live influences what it is you do. So if you live on a farm, you're probably a farmer. Uh, <laughs> and so your occupation is farmer. Your environment is farm. Your niche is farmer. Hmm. Your environment is the farm. So it, I guess the analogy that's coming to mind for me is that it's kind of like, to use an analogy from birds, it's, it's, the, it's your current nest plus your environment, yeah. something like that. Yeah, and what, and what you need to do to interact with that environment. Yeah. It's the demands the environment is placing upon you to survive and sort of reproduce, raise kids and all that other good stuff. Which, of course, I guess that's, that's huge in the development of evolutionary theory, right? So Darwin is looking at different niches, if you will, and then he's seeing the different species or, that are in those different places. And then that kind of helps spur his thinking of, well, maybe these different environments or demands of the environment contributed to the development of different species in different places. Yeah, that's right. And one of the helpful nuances when we come to humans is you, that word environment, as you indicated with birds' nests, right? It it includes all of the stuff we make and surround ourselves with yeah. too. That's part of how we are active participants in creating or constructing our niche. So it's not quite the same as usually when people talk about the environment, they think, oh, you know, it's, that's birds and trees and rocks and rivers. Yeah. It is all of that can be part of our niche, but so are our clothes and the cars right. we drive and the, the school systems that you know our kids are in, right? They're all part of that developmental environment or niche. And even the uh, things like rivers and animals, those are not fixed static realities. Those have been very much impinged upon by humans engagement with those realities, right? That's right. In fact, to a degree that I think a lot of urban folks have sort of lost track of, you know, most of the things we eat, well, they, they look very different than they did 20,000 years ago, 30,000 yeah. years ago. We've domesticated so many of these plants that now we eat. So they don't look the same as they did. We've changed yeah. them. Likewise with the animals, we've selectively bred them. And so we have constructed even the nature part of our niche, those plants and animals. We've actually done a whole lot of manipulation of them and changed their character. And likewise, that process has changed us. That's the niche we live in now. We're dependent yeah. on these things that then we've kind of played a hand in creating. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's fascinating because I, I think early in the book you say that these sorts of considerations that we're talking about right now point to the fact that the the sharp dichotomy between nature and nurture really doesn't hold up under scrutiny. That there's there's a way in which you can see that there's a there's an overlap perhaps between nature and nurture because we have so been involved in the cultivation of the change of the shape of our so-called niche that the nature and nurture kind of overlap in certain ways. Did I understand you correctly there? That and more. Uh, hmm. So yeah, absolutely. So we often use nature to mean our biological endowment uh-huh. and nurture to mean everything else, right. <laughs> all the environmental yeah. stuff. But, you know, as soon as, well, I mean, from the word go, you know, in the womb, as we're developing that cell, it, the single cell that we start with, right, is being influenced by the chemicals around it that are being produced by the mother who's being influenced by what's going on in the world around mm-hmm. her. There's just no way of extracting out in any kind of clean and consistent way what the environment is contributing. Add to that our social environment. We're such fundamentally social animals. They're part of our environment as well. So nurturing is part of our nature. It's our nature to be nurtured and it is our nature to nurture. And so teasing these apart and making them dichotomy, I just don't find helpful at all. So going back then to the so-called nature niche gap, well, let me back up there just a second. With regard to what you call fitness, that is our capacity to propagate the species, to have children, and to keep the species alive, there are certain alignment that has to occur between nature and niche. You got to survive in order to have kids, right? And yet because of the traits of our human nature, we're able to develop a niche that increasingly is difficult for us to live in. And so you say near the end of the book that our human traits or our nature become both source and solution to our problem with the gap between our nature and our niche. So could you kind of unpack that for us and kind of describe a bit more about both the opportunity and the problem that exists there? Yeah. And this one is, this is a tricky thing uh, (laughs) to describe quickly. I'll pick on one little trait to begin with. We're an immensely social animal. In the book, I even use the term hypersocial in the sense that unlike a lot of species that just have babies and maybe they raise their babies to a certain age and then they walk away and then do their own thing. We don't do it that way. We raise our kids. We Mm -hmm. invest in our kids' kids. We invest in our siblings' kids. They invest in ours. Heck, we invest in kids that aren't even related to us. Mm -hmm. We're just sort of these immensely social animals. We have big groups that we live in and have for, as far as we can tell, an awful long time compared to lots of other mammals. And we individuate them. We're not just a herd or, or a school of fish where it doesn't matter who the individuals are. You know, we, we keep track of particular individuals that we know, what their relationships are to us, to each other, whether we can trust them for this kind of information or that and so forth. So we've invested a whole lot in our sociality, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have limits. We seem to have sort of natural capacities with limitations. Like it looks like we can really have about 150 genuine personal relationships. That's what we can maintain plus or minus about 50. And partly that's a constraint of just how much memory capacity we have. Mm. Uh, So memory constraints, but also time and interaction constraints, because the depth of these relationships to keep them intimate and personal, we need to, the jargon is socially groom them. Mm. Usually that's through like giving hugs and handshakes and high fives and fist bumps, whatever it is (laughs) right now. (laughs) But physical touch is actually really important. It Mm. releases uh, endorphins, oxytocin and so forth Mm. that helps us feel bonded to and trust other people. There are other mechanisms we have for that. Synchronized movement, like we get in dance actually, doing music together. This is actually a really a nice way to do this, especially mm. unison singing, it turns out. I was hoping it was going to be harmonic singing, but it's unison really? singing seems to have an, a little extra push. Unfortunately, Bonhoeffer's right again about that unison singing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but these are, and laughing together, it, these are all mechanisms for building trust and sort of, you know, building good, trusting social communities. 
And we've got a limit on that. It seems to be around 150. So what then happens when we find ourselves, that's that's our natural kind of ideal group size. So what happens when we move into urban settings? And there are lots of good reasons for building bigger societies. So to solve problems like the neighboring band uh, keeps raiding us and, you know, taking our livestock or even killing some of us. We're like, okay, if we band up with this other group to be a bigger group, then we have more protection from attackers. That's one example. Or if four villages work together, we can actually build an irrigation system Hmm. or whatever it is, right? So scaling up has some real benefits. And so probably for fitness reasons, we built up bigger societies, but there's some costs too, is they start straining our natural social psychology. Hmm. And so now we don't know everybody intimately in the same way. We can't socially groom everyone. We can't keep track of everybody. And that starts creating new kinds of problems that then we have to solve. And we solve those and it creates new problems and we Hmm. creates new problems. But what it hasn't changed as far as we can tell is this stone aged optimal group size of about 150 relationships. I think it's a reasonable working hypothesis that I hope other scientists start looking more seriously at. I think this is a reasonable explanation for why it is that high density living is associated with all kinds of stress, anxiety, psychological disorders, violent behavior, because we almost have to start dehumanizing each other. We have to start ignoring each other if we're interacting with so many strangers all the time. I find that tragic. I think it's in some ways it's soul tearing that we learn to ignore each other when we live in cities, but we built these cities to solve other problems. So that's the kind of dynamic that we try to get at in the book with lots of examples of where we humans use these cool capacities that we have and it looks like other species don't have to solve problems and we create new problems for ourselves that then we have to solve. And that seems to be uh, an ongoing struggle with trying to solve this problem of what does it mean to live a flourishing life and how do we bring it about? Yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. So you've pointed there, throughout the book, you have three traits or complex of traits that you point to as making us particularly human or that are that are specific to and or distinctive about the human species. And the first one you just pointed to, our hyper sociability. Before we go to the, the next two, let me ask a little bit more about this. You talk about the social brain hypothesis and that in some evolutionary circles, the hypothesis is that the development of our large brain developed in conjunction with the rise of sociability. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, in particular, the what, what we call the prefrontal cortex. It's kind of our, our big foreheads, the stuff above our eyes and in front of our ears, because it's that big old mass of brain that uh, kind of distinguishes us from pretty much all other mammals. They, mm. If you, you look at other skulls, they're a lot flatter in the front than contemporary humans. And it's thought that that sort of massive growth in brain size, well, there's lots of evidence suggesting it correlates with larger and larger group sizes. Hmm. And so one hypothesis for why invest in this really huge brain, way outsized compared to other species, at least one of the leading hypotheses is it's so that we can be social animals. It's so Hmm. we can navigate all of these relationships and learn from each other and teach each other. And those aren't trivial abilities. Those are, take some special kind of processing power. I was fascinated with your discussion in this chapter of the ways in which there's a lot of stuff going on that I've I've just never... thought about until I have this sort of evolutionary psychology perspective on it. So for example, the whites of the eyes, talk about how significant that is perhaps for our species. Yeah, that one's pretty crazy. It uh, is. <laughs> <laughs> once you hear it, then you start seeing it in different places. Yes. Uh, so uh, we are unusual uh, and unique among primates and unusual among mammals in how big the whites of our eyes are relative to the colored part of our eyes. Huh. And you might think that's just accidental kind of property. But what it does is enables us to see what direction each other are looking. And that turns out to be a really important thing to do. 
because then we have a clue toward what somebody's paying attention to. And we do it so automatically, we don't even think about yeah. it. But, but from infancy, babies are already tracking, all right, what's mom looking at? Huh. Okay, when mom makes a sound and she's looking at a particular thing, maybe that sound is associated with that particular thing. Babies will, still in infancy, in their first year, they'll start checking that they are looking at the same thing mom is looking at. And how do huh. they do that? Partly it's the direction of the face, but partly it's also the the eye gaze direction. And you can tell eye gaze much easier with these big old whites of the eyes. Hmm. But once you're doing that kind of, once you have the whites of the eyes, you have so much more information about mental states. And that of course ratchets up sociality. So that one's really important. And uh, Hollywood hasn't escaped, you know, this hasn't escaped their attention. If you want to m make somebody look possessed, like they aren't uh, acting on their own, <laughs> they get rid of the whites of the eyes. Suddenly they're uh -huh. a, a vampire or a demon or a zombie or something. They get rid of the whites of the eyes. It dehumanizes instantly. It's a fascinating, fascinating kind of, uh, yeah, theatrical technique. Yeah. And then that, that sort of, uh, whites of the eyes is a part of the capacity to do so-called mind reading, right? So that we're beginning to have the capacity to try to hypothesize or speculate about what somebody else is thinking. And that becomes key as well to our sociability, hyper sociability traits. That's right. If I can track the direction you're looking, I can make inferences about what you're paying attention to and what you see. And then I can start thinking about, well, what are your mental states behind that? Okay. You, you saw this, you were paying attention to it. So that maybe leads to you forming such and such a belief. Like, you know, I hid the donuts, uh, you know, behind that rock over there. Yeah. So you got to right. tie it back to the donuts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you, your eyes didn't go toward the donuts, I might infer that you don't know where the donuts are and I'm going to have them all to myself later. So suddenly eye gaze direction is a cue to what's going on in minds. And that's something special. There are very few animals that we have solid evidence that they make mental state attributions. They think about minds and we're the only species we have good reason to think have thoughts about thoughts of other people. Hmm. maybe even thoughts about our own thoughts, what we call meta representation. So we're thinking about Aunt Susan's thoughts about my cousins making donuts and whether she likes my cousin making donuts. Yeah, we can do that easily. Or, you know, you and I can think about whether we are sharing the same thoughts. Yeah. And that's important for teaching and for that mm. then expertise acquisition and so forth. So for, mm. for you to teach me something, you need to have a good reason to think that I'm thinking along the same lines you want me to be thinking along. And it's really helpful if I think I'm thinking along the same lines you think, you know, you want me to be thinking along. Right. But we're having to sort of get inside each other's heads quite a bit there. And as far as we can yeah. tell, other species just do not do this to the degree that humans do at least. And most just don't do it at all. They just pay attention to behaviors. That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that, that just makes me consider more explicitly things that I'm aware of in t the process of teaching, but I don't ne guess I've really thought about, right? Because I'm always paying careful attention to my students' faces, where they're looking when I'm lecturing, how they're looking, whether they're looking up in a particular way or looking off in a distracted way. Yeah, that's just fascinating. So that that then leads us to the second sort of uh, characteristic human trait that you work with at some length about the capacity to process huge amounts of information and develop specialization. So talk to us a little bit about that particular trait. Yeah, because of this sociality and because we're born kind of immature. Okay, not kind of, a lot immature. <laughs> 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 that's not a slam on us as a species. It's just a fact. We've got a long lifespan and we take a long time to get to reproductive age. And we're born kind of feeble. We can't walk. We can't fight for ourselves. We can't feed ourselves. You know, we're not like the, the horse that drops out of mom and is walking around. Yeah. You know, pretty much instantly. We can't do that. And that means we've got lots of time to learn, to start packing information into these giant heads of ours. But mostly we're learning that from each other. All right, we're social learners and part of that, you know, that ability to read each other's minds, pay attention to what, he, what each other are thinking facilitates this intensive teaching. Uh, we may be the only species that deliberately and intentionally teaches others hmm. and almost surely the only one that teaches others who are not related to us. Hmm. It's sometimes called allo parenting. That's huh. the sort of jargon for it. it was we, you know, cause if, if a kid walks up to you and says, Hey, mister, what's that thing called? You go, Oh, it's, it's called this. You don't go get away from me, stupid kid. Yeah. I don't know you. <laughs> we just do. 
Uh, there's something something about it. So, what, and why is that a good thing? Well, we can learn from the community what they've acquired in terms of uh, the particulars of how to navigate this space, how to live in this niche, how to exploit it, how to use it properly, how to survive and thrive. And that's important for species like us that has moved all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. Most animals that have moved, okay, most animals stay put, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Wherever they grew up, that's where they stay because their nature then gives them the tools to fit into that niche and solve the problems yeah. there. Humans have colonized pretty much every niche on earth. And there are very few other species that have done that. And when they have, they do it by changing their genetic code to adapt to those environments. We don't. We do it by learning, by acquiring lots of specific information for that particular location, that particular job, mostly from, from others or jointly with others, mm -hmm. all this joint problem solving. So we acquire expertise. And then that also, that ability allows us to diversify what we all do. We don't all have to know the same things. And that then feeds back in a sort of positive feedback loop on sociality. We become dependent on each other. Some people mm. are better hunters, others are better gatherers, others are better house builders, others are better, you know, child rearers, and we all need each other then. That's, you know, sort of in ancient times, contemporary times, of course, the diversity of tasks that we do and our dependence, interdependence on each other is much, much greater now. You know, your typical urban dweller wouldn't last a, a week probably and without everybody else around them. So that then relates to habits like conformity. You talk about the importance of conformity in growth in specialization or learning education, how does that kind of stuff play out in both the sociability and the specialization traits? Right. So the acquisition of information is so important to us to learn those, you know, survival skills that are pertinent to our location that we've got what look to be, we sometimes call them learning biases, but biases uh, sort of sounds negative. You might just think some uh, proclivities. The way we're inclined or disposed. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We're disposed because if we try to imitate everybody, we're going to have poor quality sort of information because mm. we're surrounded by so many people. So you need kind of strategies for picking out who am I going to learn from? These are sometimes called social learning biases or, you know, tendencies, proclivities. One of the really handy ones that we've got is this conformity bias. Well, what's, what's most everybody else doing? That's mm -hmm. what I'm going to go for. That's sort of my default is I'm just, especially everybody else who's a lot like me. That's yeah. called the similarity bias. We're, we're inclined to imitate, conform to the behaviors, the thinking patterns, the ways of speaking, dressing, and so forth of people who we perceive to be like us. So even, even accents then, you point to even accents being significant in the way we kind of default to who we're paying attention to? That's right. Uh, from infancy, it looks like babies prefer to pay attention to and to learn from somebody who speaks like they do, hmm. or especially like their mom does if they can't speak yet. Right. So they've already, in the womb, it seems, they're already adjusting to mom's vocal patterns. Yeah. I mean, this gives me a very helpful way to think about the ways in which New Englanders very stereotypically look down their nose at Southern accents is that they're just operating out of their stone age mind when they do that. Uh, that's right. A stone age, <laughs> stone age. I'm not, yeah. Yeah. One way or the other. Well, it, I mean, you're joking, but, uh, sort of, um, <laughs> but accents are for this reason, accents are really great in group out group markers. Yeah. They're hard to fake really convincingly and well, but they're acquired so early in life that they're a really good kind of indicator of, well, who's like me? Yeah. And I'm going to automatically give the benefit of the doubt to people who I perceive to be like me. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I should have noted earlier, and the research shows kids are more sensitive to accent than they are things like skin color. So huh. the racially constructed kind of categories that Americans are sort of all really excited about are actually kind of a weird artificial overlay. The true sort of in-group out-group markers are things like how do we dress, how do we eat, our accent, because those are the ones that are more ancient markers mm -hmm. of who's in-group and out-group. In right. yeah. And they're reasonably good. 
But I expect then Southerners mistrust uh, New Englanders as well yeah. for similar reasons. That's right. Uh, if they don't say y'all, we know that there's at least some investigation to do to find out if they're trustworthy or not. And what's with those missing R's on car and things like that, you know, yes, instead of a one, car? I, I mean, what, what is that, that makes about? makes no sense whatsoever. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're listening to Tokens, Public Theology, Human Flourishing, The Good Life, and we are most grateful to have you joining us. If you've not yet done so, subscribe today to the Tokens podcast on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, CastBox, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. We do love hearing from you and are always pleased to hear some of the things you'd like to hear more about. You can email us at podcast at tokensshow.com. Also, remember, you can sign up for our email list or find out how to join us for a live event all at tokensshow.com. Shout outs today to our top 10 cities of listeners of the Tokens podcast. Number one, Nashville. Two, Atlanta. Three, our neighbors over in Murfreesboro. Four, out west to Dallas. Five, east to Knoxville. Six, coming in at number six, Hutchinson, Kansas. I think you all may have the nickname Salt City, maybe, or Hutch. I think the locals may call your town there. And as I was looking at Google Maps, it seems that Hutchinson, Kansas falls right in the middle almost of west to east, right in the middle of the United States of America. Hutchinson, Kansas, so pleased to have you all joining us there. Number seven, Charlotte, North Carolina, lovely Charlotte. Way out west to number eight to the northwest, Portland, Oregon, up to the great Midwest, Chicago, Illinois at number nine, and down south to Birmingham, Alabama. So glad my friends in Alabama made the top ten list of cities listening in to the tokens podcast greetings to all my friends there in birmingham birmingham was where we went when i was a boy raised in talladega alabama if we wanted a good restaurant or needed to go shopping we drive over to birmingham lots of good memories of birmingham thanks to you all for listening wherever you are listening from delighted to have you joining us this is our interview with justin barrett coming up we'll hear more helpful ideas from evolutionary psychology as well as Justin's thoughts on the supposed conflict between Christian faith and evolutionary theory. Part two, in just a moment. Welcome back to Tokens and our interview with Justin Barrett. You talked about the gap between nature and niche with sociability and the developments, for example, of urban cityscapes. What's the gap that makes it hard for us to thrive with regard to specialization and the capacity to acquire a great deal of information? Yeah, here we seem to be constantly chasing chasing the carrot in front of us the same way in that we've got this great capacity to learn new stuff to develop new tools, new expertise, then that is beneficial. So we keep driving that. But once again, as with sociality, we're not infinitely flexible learners, right? So I talked about social learning biases. So one Mm -hmm. way in which you can think there can be a gap is in living in really cosmopolitan spaces, suddenly we're surrounded by people who do sound different than we do, do send off the signals that they're not part of my group. And yet I'm expected to learn from them. So Mm -hmm. there's an extra obstacle there. That one is, I think, serious in some respects, but a funnier one is uh, one of these cues for social learning is prestige or skill. These are also biases that have a pretty good documentation in the the scientific research now. Um, So if we perceive somebody to be particularly prestigious, then we are more likely to imitate them, to learn from them and so forth. But with mass media, People can be famous and have all of the indicators of prestige Mm. for really stupid reasons, or at least reasons that are completely unrelated to the domain. So, you know, the example I think I give in the book, because it's always stuck with me is, why in the world do I know what underwear Michael Jordan wears? (laughs) You know, I mean, we, we all know Hanes, right? Hanes is his brand. Well, why should I care? Great ball player. But how does that translate into expertise with regard to what underwear I should wear? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's completely irrelevant, but there it is. 
Yeah. And so you get these, and that's why advertising works. They keep trotting out these sort of famous, prestigious people. And we go, yes, yes. How oh, I'm going to pay attention to this. I'm like, but why are their views on politics any better than the guy at the end of the street? Right. Yeah. So you have this pretty pointed line where you say in times past, it would have been hard for the village idiot to gain a following. And yet now, because of our own human traits, we've made that quite possible, right? We've made it possible. Not only can they gain a following, they could even get an office if they, yeah. you know, in, in politics, if they need yeah. to, you know, yeah. and yeah, we used to be a little bit closer to the ground where you could really see, does the person have the goods or not? Right. That's one example. There are other examples about expertise in this gap. It's nature niche gap. And, you know, we've developed these really cool science and math fields, the STEM subjects, right? These take a lot of cultural investment and a lot of deliberate education and training and so forth. And they do lots of cool things. But all of that work is indicative of how unnatural they are to our minds. <laughs> Our minds have natural sort of sweet spots for learning. They have paths of least resistance, proclivities that make some learning easier than others. And we're going to have to work an awful lot harder with some of those other things, like some of the STEM subjects, and not at no cost. So we can really crush the spirit of some kids who this just doesn't come to them very easily. Their brain goes in a different direction. But if we treat all kids as if they're the same and really they're just kind of a piece of wood that we can work any way we want, I think we do harm to those kids. Let's talk about the third kind of human trait you talk about, that of self-control. Give us a description of how this becomes key to being human from an evolutionary psychology perspective. Right. So we, there's that old chestnut that when you, you know, you get scared, your fight or flight uh, mechanism kicks in. Yeah. Sometimes it's fight, flight, or freeze. We've got that. We all know we've got that. Get really scared. That's the impulse. What's kind of interesting about humans, and again, seems to be distinctive is we can shut it down. Hmm. We can go, you know what, instead of fighting, running away or freezing, I'm going to talk my way out of this. Huh. Want to talk your way out of it? I'm going to emotionally regulate. I'm going to say, now is not the time for fear. I'm going to think about this another way. Or am I really angry at that person or am I just frustrated and disappointed? Hmm. Or, you know, less fancifully, maybe in some ways, I get to evaluate whether I want to go to, uh, you know, whether today I'm going to go to Chick-fil-A or not. Um, <laughs> Uh, I can make a decision. I can sort of spell it out. Well, if I go over to Chick-fil-A, I'm going to be tempted by their seasonal shake. And that's a delicious, but I can't really manage those calories on top of everything else. So I better steer clear of there. I am using this massive brain I've got to override my impulses, to think through different possibilities, to speculate about possible futures, and then make decisions based on that. That's a pretty cool trick for an animal to do. We try to train our dogs to do this, but eventually, you know, you're balancing that, that bacon on your dog's nose. It is going to take that yeah. bacon away, <laughs> um, especially if nobody's looking. But humans have this weird ability to actually get in their own heads and exercise self-control even when no one is looking. Hmm. And that's located, I think, in the prefrontal cortex as well, right? That prefrontal cortex also plays a really important role in that, for yeah. sure. I mean, that's what's fascinating is all three of these categories of capacities, that hypersociality, the expertise acquisition, and self-control are all importantly facilitated by this big old prefrontal cortex. Hmm. Yeah. I, I find this fascinating. I've been reading a bit on this from a number of folks in the last couple of years about the insights that we're getting about willpower, perhaps best understood metaphorically as a muscle. So describe that to us. Yeah, it has been a really helpful metaphor. So we know with muscles, you can get them stronger by working them out. But we also know that immediately after a strenuous workout, they just don't do much, right? You can, you can work them to exhaustion and then you can't do anything. Yeah. And at least a lot of the time, it looks like self-control is a bit like that. Mm -hmm. So that is to say, we can 
we can make this muscle stronger. We can get more self-controlled if we give it steady doses of exercise. Yeah. If we, we practice restraining ourselves, we practice motivating ourselves to do things we don't want to do. That's good for us. It seems yeah. like it builds up that self-control, but immediately after a whole big dose of temptation, we're probably vulnerable to make a really bad decision yeah. and not just, you know, uh, that kind of, uh, exhaustion, but it could be honest to goodness, physical exhaustion. When we're really yeah. tired, we just don't right. have the same kind of resources to override. Or if we've been drinking too much, right. That's yeah. when people often make bad decisions. And that's because that, that self-control muscle is impaired and it, it just can't do the job right now. You know, the way I, it's helped me a great deal is to think if each day I have kind of a limited amount of self-control to be wise about what I invest that in. And for me, it's been learning to try to invest that at least some daily in habits, helpful habits, which can then minimize how much I have to negotiate with myself in future days. And then I can use my self-control in other areas down the road. I can't change all my habits today, but I can work on one today or maybe two or three at most today. And then down the road, I can start working on some others because I've invested my willpower carefully today and then have greater capacity to do other stuff later. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Lee. That's that's the prudent thing to do. If you've got a finite resource, invest it strategically so that you don't have to use as much of it. And habits yeah. help us not use as much of it. So let's move then to the, the notion of thriving. How... How are you thinking about evolutionary psychology and how what that can teach us or help us construe the notion of thriving or human flourishing? Yeah, one, one thing I want to be very clear about is I don't think that evolutionary psychology can deliver the goods on telling us what a thriving life is. Some of its champions sure talk like it can. But they're smuggling in a lot of assumptions and values that the science itself doesn't give you. Mm. In some ways, the book project was an exploration in it, in how far can it help us and mm -hmm. where are its limitations? Yeah. And so, you know, we end up concluding, hey, this is a really helpful tool, but it can't get us all the way to the idea of a full, flourishing, thriving life, you know, how we ought to live. Sciences are not good with that ought thing. Uh, and, and evolutionary psychology is no exception to that, but where it is helpful, I think is in some ways it, it helps us zoom out a little bit from the particulars of our situation or our cultural situation and think, okay, broader scale, what seems to have worked out pretty well for humans? What are we pretty good at? What are the consequences of some of the decisions we've made? And let's let those answers to those questions start informing the, okay, and now what can we do about it? Mm. Especially if we c approach evolutionary psychology through a, a Christian lens where we're accepting for the sake of argument that this is the way that God created us and he knew what he was doing. So if God intended fully to create us as we are through this evolutionary process, he was kind of using that to build into us certain kinds of proclivities, certain kinds of limitations, certain kinds of passions, and expecting that then we would do what we ought to with those things and that they're enough for us to then have this flourishing kind of uh, life that he called us to. Well, enough, you know, by his grace and whatever other resources mm -hmm. he wants to give us. So that's kind of how we're trying to think through <laughs> yeah. bringing evolutionary psychology to this idea of thriving or flourishing because by itself, evolution just talks about fitness. Yeah. Are you up to the task of staying alive long enough to make babies and then maybe investing in them long enough that they make babies? Yeah. So your genes keep going on. That's fitness. Well, that, that's not thriving. That's not the same thing, right? Yeah. You could make lots of babies and have a miserable life. And we would think that's probably not right. Or you could make no babies and have a really great, full, rich life Yeah, that most of us would say, no, that's probably a thriving life. Uh, yeah. You know, you think of Mother Teresa or someone like that, you'd go, well, that's a pretty good, well-lived life. 
but she didn't, you know, have kids or Jesus, a uh, pretty mm-hmm. great life. But as far as we know, his genes didn't pass on. Yeah. So the evolutionary psychology then does a good job of description and description of possibilities, descriptions of limits, capacities, and then you need uh, some other sort of authority, discipline, field of study from merely a human perspective to fill in some of the alt questions or the normative questions. The first is good at description, and then we need something for prescription. And then that's, that's, that's your theological turn where you're saying there's, there's lots of overlap uh, it's not a, it's not a complete overlap, but there's a lot of overlap between the discipline of evolutionary psychology and Christian theology. Uh, but the Christian theology supplements what the evolutionary psychology can't accomplish for us. That's right. Well said. One of the fun surprises to me in the process of you know doing the research for and trying to put this book together was seeing that wow, there's by no means a perfect overlap between you know, what we're learning from evolutionary psychology about what's good for fitness, or at least has been in our past and what we ought to do from a Christian perspective. But there are enough points of connection to be interesting and fruitful. Mm -hmm. And one of those was, you know, Christian theology emphasizes that uh, a life well lived is characterized by love. You know, that, gee, we're supposed to, we're called to, you know, love God and love each other really well and in a selfless kind of way. And then, well, but what are the capacities needed to do that? Well, we need to be drawn to other people. That's part of loving. Well, that's that hypersociality. Mm-hmm. We need to know enough about their particular situation so that we can care for them as an individual, not as part of some anonymous project or, or not just as I would be lived. Well, that requires expertise acquisition. And I need to be able to love them in a way that isn't just to benefit me. I have to shut me down to be able to love them well. Well, that's self-control. So it turns out these three clusters of traits are also really important for loving other people well, especially people that, you know, are outside of our family or a little bit more unfamiliar to us that can't just be habit. So in a real sense, from an evolutionary perspective, it starts looking like one way of capturing what makes humans really special is we're the animal that can love and love well. That doesn't mean we do all the time, of course, yeah. <laughs> but at least we've got the toolkit for it. And that's kind of a fun discovery to make, I think. I was fascinated by the way, I don't remember if it's the seventh or eighth chapter, where a couple of times you use language of saying, well, we might even rightfully call such and so sin, but we can supplement our understanding of that by looking at evolutionary psychology. I don't remember what the examples were in particular. I think maybe one of them was about love that you just mentioned, but could you describe that a little bit more? For what, what are you trying to do there in kind of supplementing what we might traditionally call sin with evolutionary psychology? insights. Well, I mean, we were talking about donuts. We can come back to donuts yeah. <laughs> as an example, right? We've got a natural propensity, you might say, toward being o- overly attracted to donuts. And that could lead to a sin of gluttony, for instance. Well, from an evolutionary perspective, at least we have a better understanding of well, why is there this strong natural predisposition? Some of us feel even more mm-hmm. than others. And what are the tools we have then to combat that? We don't want to immediately, because something seems to be congruent with our nature, to say, oh, well, that makes it okay. Yeah, right. Well, no, just because it's the it's easy for us doesn't make it good, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? We don't want to fall into that trap. Or the, or the converse. We don't want to say just because it's natural, it's bad. Right. Um, either way, the understanding that we get by studying our nature helps us better appreciate just what the challenge is that we're facing there. Mm-hmm. Instead of merely saying it's sin, we can say, okay, it's sin, but... Let's understand that a little better. Another example is, you know, comes from our sort of groupishness. We are an extremely groupish animal. It's part of this hyper sociality and part of those learning biases and so forth is we are drawn to certain, well, people that we perceive to be like us in the relevant kinds of ways to invest in some people much more than other people to care for them a whole lot more than other people and so forth. We form groups. That's what we do. 
And it's easy to see that in some context that leads to really bad behavior. We mm -hmm. start, you know, mistreating outgroup members. And but we want to be careful, I think, with simply labeling the tendency to uh, invest in our in-group as sin, right? It is part of our nature. There's an open theological question whether that's fallen nature or <laughs> just the way we are. If it's just the way we are, then can we leverage that tendency in more positive ways is the question we should be asking, not can we eradicate it? Yeah, And I think some theorists have thought, oh no, the, the solution to all this groupishness, which includes racism and other kinds of you know, xenophobia and so forth, is to eradicate all group membership. Well, that's impossible. You're not going to do it. Let me just assure yeah. you that that is impossible. And some of these philosophical and you're not you're not so just to be clear to people who are listening, you're not saying it's impossible to eradicate racism as such, or that, that that's right. But, but it, in, instead, it's it's impossible for us to have any sort of functional notion of being human apart from some sort of group identities or group participation. Correct, correct. That's right. So what we want to do is change our groupishness in more productive and positive directions. Yeah. So you know. Jesus calls us to, you know, love our enemies and to love our neighbor, but he doesn't, as far as I can tell, call us to pretend that our neighbor is one of our children. Mm. They're still a neighbor and not a family member. Right. And that's okay. As long as we are loving our neighbor. Yeah. The church is the body of Christ and there are people who are not part of the church and there are distinctions from a Christian perspective between who's, who's the church and who isn't. And it's okay to make those distinctions as long as the church then isn't characterized by mistreating those who are not the church, instead by loving well those who are outside the church. Yeah. This should be an inclusive community that's characterized by that inclusiveness and that service to people who are outside the community. But it doesn't mean that you don't have an in-group and an out-group. Right. Salvation Army, I think, is a good example of this. Their identity is around taking care of other people. And so there are positive ways, I think, to leverage our groupishness instead of just saying, oh, no, somehow we've got to put a, I don't know, a chip in our brains that tells us that everybody's the same. No, we're going to mess up our humanity at that point. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, two things in particular percolate up for me. One is that in moral philosophy, when you look especially at virtue traditions, those conversations around desires, so-called natural desires, typically will say desire is not the problem. It's a, it's a disordered attachment to a desire or a disordered employment of a desire. So the question instead is how does one rightfully order, say, for example, uh, sexual desire or the desire for the donut or the desire for sociability and security, that those things are not bad in and of themselves. And even I would say from a Christian perspective, Jewish perspective, you know, the Genesis story is about the goodness of all of creation, including sex, music, food, friendship, and so forth. So these things are good, but the question is whether or not they are ordered rightfully uh, according to that particular limited end. And the second thing that percolates up for me is that just in a very practical way, you know, your conversation about love, I, I think some years ago I realized, and this is a very mundane sort of example, but I just realized, look, I can't get to everybody's funeral that I would like to get to because you know, in a, in a city where you know not just 150 people, but thousands of people, you know, you can't get to everywhere you would like to get to. And and um, so then accepting, it doesn't mean I don't love someone who's, I don't get to their father's funeral. It's instead of the reality of the limited nature of social capacity. But I don't know, any thoughts or comments about that? I'm, I'm feeling uncomfortable even using that as an example, but I think it's a really highly practical implication of something that you're pointing to there. Let me assure you that that sounds just right, and you don't have to feel bad about that. Um, exactly. Uh, what we, what our experience tells us, and now increasingly what the science tells us, is we just can't. We can't yeah. love as you know everybody the same way, and that's okay. I don't think we should put that burden on ourselves because it can lead to a couple of ills, right? One of those is we actually destroy our capacity to love anybody well mm, right? because we're so anxious and worried and worked up about trying to love everyone well. The other is we end up changing love into something very thin 
thin enough that we can cover everybody. And so then we start anonymizing people and treating them as projects or, Mm -hmm. you know, big groups that somehow we have to care for. Oh, I, oh, I'm very invested in loving the X community. Like, well, how about the people in that community? Do you love any of them or do you just love that abstract notion of, I don't know, Africa or, you know, what it is I'm, I'm all for it. Well, what about the people? So I think there there are a couple of dangers with trying to put the burden on us too greatly that somehow we've got to love everybody the same and everybody the same way. Yeah. We just can't do it. So right. it's okay. Don't do it. Don't do yeah. it. <laughs> but love those that you can well. Do it well. This is all very fascinating. I, I think in just the last couple of minutes, what I want to do is maybe get to one question that I think I'll, some people listening would expect me to ask uh, that some people might expect would have been asked at the very top of the interview. But I'm leaving it to the very end for, for a reason. And that is for those who find a sort of sense of immediate threat between engaging evolutionary theory from a Christian perspective, from a faith perspective, um, you clearly don't have, you don't feel threatened by that. So what would you say to those who have stuck this long to hear what they said, but they still have this kind of discomfort with evolutionary theory generally? I guess uh, to those folks, I'd say, I understand. I have felt that threat too. And there are moments when I still feel that threat. But in the world that we live in, in order to at least understand what these science type people are doing and the science and technology areas are major culture shapers. So we need people of faith in those spaces in a full bodied kind of way, Um, not as outside critics, just throwing rocks, but they need to be participants and they need to bring their faith tradition into those science and technology spaces. We're missing too many great minds and good, valuable perspectives from the Christian faith in particular in this country because we've excluded ourselves from the halls of science. Mm-hmm. I think we've got a uh, an obligation to be in that space and to do it well. But to do that, we need to understand it. Mm. And... Um, like it or not, the sciences are uh, the, the, the best interpretation that, uh, of why we have the species of animals we have, and maybe even why humans have some of the proclivities that they have, is an evolutionary perspective. And so one of the things that I've done is asked myself, well, is it possible that God used an evolutionary process to bring us about, to bring about other species? Is that outside of God's power? surely not outside of God's power. Is it outside of God's character? I can't tell that it is. Um, There's some interesting arguments philosophers will have about that, but I think oftentimes they're based on misunderstandings about evolutionary theory, like it being purposeless. Well, that's no, it's, that's not an assumption that's built into the science. Uh, from a Christian perspective, we could say, no, God has purposes through evolution among other things. So is it possible that God used it? Yeah, I think it is. Okay, then let me understand it the best I can and see if it gives me explanatory tools or fresh perspectives that are useful in Mm -hmm. fitting in with uh, what I know from my Christian commitments and and see how it goes. And if at the end of this exploration, I've I've decided I just can't make them go together, that's all right. It's not the most important thing. Intelligent people can just you know, and, you know, God fearing people can disagree about these things and we can still get along, but give it a fair shot and see if uh, you learn something useful. And even if you don't think it's true about the real world at the end of it, at least you've learned something about your brothers and sisters who, who do think there's something valuable here. Yeah. We've been talking to Justin Barrett, founder and president of Blueprint 1543 and author most recently of the book entitled Thriving with Stone Age Minds, Evolutionary Psychology, Christian Faith, and the Quest for Human Flourishing. Thanks so much, Justin, for the great conversation. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Lee. It's been fun to talk. 
You've been listening to Tokens, Public Theology, Human Flourishing, The Good Life. If you'd like to hear more about how faith and psychology might work together, then we have two previous episodes that might be to your liking. First, a season two interview with Dr. Mark McMinn entitled, What Hath Christianity to Do with Psychology? And second, a season three interview with Dr. Kurt Thompson on his book, The Soul of Shame. Remember, you can subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your favorite podcast. And if you'd like to get occasional emails from us with various goodies, updates on podcast episodes, updates on opportunities to join us for live events, then go over to our website at tokenshow.com and join our email list. Our thanks to all the stellar team that makes this podcast possible. Executive producer and manager Christy Bragg of Bragg Management, co-producer Jacob Lewis of Great Feeling Studios, associate producers Ashley Bain and Tom Anderson, our engineer Carriot Harmon, music beds by Zach and Maggie White, and Blue Dot Sessions. Thanks for listening, and peace be unto thee. Tokens Podcast is a production of Tokens Media, LLC, and... Great Feeling Studio. Oh. <laughs>